Afghanistan, known as the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, achieved its independence from Great Britain following the year 1919. This country is entirely landlocked, bordered by nations including Iran, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and China, known for their unique allure. The snow leopard proudly stands as the country's national symbol. With a population of around 30 million, approximately 39% are literate, leaving about 16 million unable to read or write. Additionally, 1.3 million Afghans reside in Iran, while another 2.5 million have made their homes in Pakistan. The country is mainly shaped by Islam, with adherents at 98%. Globally, out of approximately 200 countries, just 28 permit entry to Afghan nationals without any hurdles. Locally, the typical person smokes once every six days. Many Afghans celebrate their birthdays on January 1st, mainly because a lot of them don't know their real birth dates, choosing instead the start of the year for celebration. It's unsure if you remember the famous National Geographic magazine cover from 1985, which showed a woman from Afghanistan distinct in appearance was located in 2002. Intriguingly, she was unaware of the widespread fame her photograph had achieved. In a paradoxical twist, during the ancient era, the regions encompassing Afghanistan stood as the pivotal hub for the Silk Road. Remarkably, it wasn't until the year 2010 that the initiation of the railway network's construction took place. A total of 85 kilometers of railway tracks were laid down. As of now, they lack any form of passenger train services, offering merely two railway connections. On the other hand, the widely used buses predominantly consist of aged Mercedes-Benz models. Intriguingly, the country enforces a prohibition on the importation of automobiles that exceed 10 years of age. Indeed, while the number of railway tracks might be surprisingly few, almost as scarce as a cat's tears, the nation significantly compensates with its opium output. Annually, over 4,000 tons are produced here. To be precise, 4,000 tons. And it's truly remarkable that Afghanistan accounts for 90% of the world's opium. More details on the country's history will be shared later, offering a brief overview for now. Before diving into that, let's explore a distinctive market in the capital. In Kabul, there exists an unusual market that's been named after the former U.S. President George Bush. And it has this name because of what is traded here. Items stolen from American soldiers are sold here. But trade is not the basis of life in this country. Agriculture is the main source of income for Afghans. Afghanistan is also rich in natural resources, such as natural gas and oil. Afghanistan is renowned for producing top quality pomegranates, melons, apricots, and grapes. By pomegranates, I specifically refer to the fruit. Given its history, it's unsurprising Afghanistan is among the world's least economically developed nations. This nation ranks among the world's most impoverished. Prolonged conflicts and a virtual absence of international investments have plunged it into extreme destitution. It hosts some of the most notorious terrorist groups globally. Consequently, construction emerges as a major industry within the country. It's important to note that this country is not suitable for the elderly. Here, women are permitted to marry at 16 and men at 18. Typically, Couples have their first child about four years after marrying, often having up to five kids. The average household age is 18, highlighting family importance in Afghan culture. Men usually earn and women handle home tasks, though progressive families might differ. Most families live together, with married sons and their wives getting their own room. In this nation, it is required that women adorn themselves in conservative attire, concealing their allure. It is customary to refrain from making direct eye contact between different genders. While shaking hands might be acceptable, it is frequently observed that individuals place their hand over their heart as a gesture of respect and acknowledgement. But again, not between a man and a woman. Marriage is considered an important part of life in Afghanistan. Divorce is not welcome. Interestingly, Marriages are three-day rites, during which a marriage contract is signed and a husband and wife unite. When the Soviet troops withdrew from Afghanistan, their departure was rapid, compelled by circumstances that necessitated leaving some of their military equipment behind. Scattered across the barren landscapes, one can still discover deteriorating tanks, armored vehicles, firearms, and trucks, all succumbing to rust. And indeed, they are not encompassed within the projects funded by the state's budget. However, 
these represent merely a fraction of the remnants left by the courageous Soviet soldiers. This is because the Soviet Union deployed more than 10 million landmines across Afghanistan. Locating each one of them and subsequently neutralizing their threat would require a time frame extending over several millennia. Undoubtedly, the regular occurrence of warfare, bombings, acts of terrorism, drone strikes, along with numerous other terrorist and military activities, have led to Afghanistan being labeled as a failed nation. That is, one in which no structures, authorities, or social infrastructure have completely failed. And now the part for those who want to learn a little about where the Russians come from in the country, what's going on with the Sunnites, Shiites, Taliban, and why it is so tragic in this country today. Great Britain and Russia have always been interested in the areas of Afghanistan. In the interwar period, a coup d'etat allows the People's Democratic Party to take power. Although she did not enjoy universal recognition, she began reforms to arrange everything as it was organized in the Soviet Union. Some people didn't like it. The police began to suppress the protests, but it was not enough to suppress all resistance. The citizens said a big no with the Quran in their hands, but the communists, breaking quite a lot of basic human rights, crushed the rebellion with a large number of victims. Then the newly elected communist president who invited the KGB to introduce even more communism into the country, well, just before New Year's Eve, 1979, the president, interestingly enough, died, but at the hands of Soviet commandos in disguise for Afghan soldiers. This was enough for 200 of Soviet planes and armored ground troops to land. This didn't go down well in America. The UN told the Soviets to leave, and the Americans threatened that if the Russians did not withdraw quickly, they would make a third Rambo movie. Moscow was deaf to all arguments. At the same time, the Afghans themselves said they had had enough and either began to cultivate the art of guerrilla warfare or moved away. Therefore, 3 million people emigrated to Pakistan and 2 million to Iran, where they organized the opposition. In the 1980s, almost 85 of the country was in the hands of partisans, and the local communist government extended its tender protection. Michael Gorbachev changed the president, who introduced a new constitution, which in turn ruled that Islam was the national religion. At the end of the 1980s, Soviet troops withdrew from the country, but this did not solve the issue of ending the war. The communists remained in control, but they crushed the rebels. The group was split into two main factions, the Sunnis, who constituted the majority, and the Shiites, representing a smaller segment of the population. Sunnis represent the majority of people in Afghanistan. About 85 of the population just supports them. Shiites, on the other hand, are supported by only 15 of the population. But it is not this support that is their driving force, because their driving force is Iran. Two groups of Sunnis and Shiites quarreled with each other and fought fiercely. Their squabbles led to the rise of the third and forces among them. And these were the Taliban we know today, 